of creation. Okay? So, you have, so you have to get used to this idea of an also known as list. Okay? I call it an AKA list. So these beings had different genetics that we do. And you have to get used to the idea that the Greeks believed their gods were immortal. Maybe they weren't immortal, but they lived so much longer than they did, they seemed immortal to them. Okay? But the idea of a name changing in a culture and it still being the same being is hard for us to believe. And that's probably why they did it. I call it namesake inclusion. But uh, once you see their symbols and attributes, it becomes very clear that it's the same capital. Okay. Here comes Brian. Okay. So the next one is Amy. This is a picture of uh, Ahura Mazda. That was his name in Persia, according to the Zoroastrian religion. And uh, he can actually read, uh, my wife can actually read Farsi. He's going to tell you what these three symbols here mean. What's this? Right. Means speak well, act well, and think well. Really? Right. He was known as the god. Speak well, act well, and think well. Now, Zoroastrian music was very interesting to me because Zarathustra introduced this concept of the, these two, I would call it the two highest ranking beings from the Anunnaki Council, ended up in the Zoroastrian religion. It turned out to be Anki and Anwar. And when you dig a little further, you find out that the connection between Kem and Zarathustra was none other than Enki's son, Nikshidim. So his son helped find, found the Persian dynasty, and his father was the chief deity of Ur Mazda, the god of light and wisdom. Who was his arch nemesis? You know, don't you? Who was the arch nemesis to Ahura Mazda? He was the creator of all good light. Exactly. Angra Mainu, and he had a couple other names as well. He was the great destroyer. So this is actually the basis of Christianity, but having a god and a devil, this is where it came from. Okay, so there's a real basis for this, and now you realize it goes right back to the two highest ranking beings on the Anunnaki Council that were here on Earth at the time. Anu was gone. Remember, he drew lots and he went back to the group. Okay, so this is on the, uh, this depiction is on the Temple of Persepolis, and there's several other, there were multiple capitals in Persia, and his, his image showed up on all of them. And as a matter of fact, he also showed up on the cliffs of the Histun, where Darius I was king, venerating him for helping him suppress all the uprisings in his kingdom. Okay. Uh, he, he was born in Balfe, which is a city in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the fact that he's here from Afghanistan really makes this real for a lot of you. This was, this was a real being. This wasn't just a comic book myth. This is real. I, I appreciate that because I never knew that those three things were, so thank you. Yeah, so and also about, uh, I believe it was around the 7th century, about 639, in that area, in that time frame, is when the Islam, Islamic army came in and overran the uh, Persian dynasty. Okay, so that's when Islam was on the rise and Zoroastrian was on the descent. Yeah, so, so, okay. Um, How does Buddha relate to him? How does Buddha relate we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to We'll get to the uh, Buddha a little bit later, okay? So Afghanistan, half of it at that time, before Islam was the test, and right. half of it was Buddhist. Well, remember that in the, in the Indus Valley, the, uh, no, the Buddhist. I know, the sacred feminine started there, but as you moved over, uh, you'll find out that it had very much a relationship to Nikshita himself. And we'll talk. Uh, so Enki was a scientist, and he was here to get gold. And in the Atrahasis, they had a problem. After one Tsar, which was 3,600 years, they had a revolt in South Africa in the mines. And the beings that were brought to work those mines, they called them the Ajiji. Everybody's heard that, right? Uh, they considered them fellow gods, even though they were doing all the work. Okay, so these were not dumbed down, primitive workers who didn't understand what was going on. They were ancient astronauts just like the Niburians were that brought them. They were just a lower class of Anunnaki. Right? So at, at, in the Atrahasis, they were led by one of the beings on that council who was called Allah. His name shows up right in the document, the first tablet, where he, he talked to the Ajiji who'd been working these mines for an entire 3,600 year period. Day and night, they were driving to get gold. They finally got together under Allah's rule. His, and this is Nanar Sin and Lul's son, 
decided to tell them that they were going to rebel against their enslavers and they wanted, they wanted relief. And when they got together under all this, uh, I don't know, fanning the flames of revolt, they decided to burn their tools, they picked up weapons, and they surrounded a edifice in South Africa that just happened to be occupied by Enel at the time. So Enel was out of Mesopotamia, down in Africa, probably cracking the whip as the Lord of Command, okay? They surrounded his house and they demanded relief. At this point, Enel got very upset that they, his slaves were revolting. He goes, well, just kill one and send him back to work. And at this point, Enki got summoned, and Anu got summoned because they realized there was a real problem. And Enki and Anu said, you know, we've been hearing the noise, and we've been hearing the cries about the enslavement, and we didn't do anything. Okay, and now it's come to this. as a revolt. Okay, so now the only way they had to get these, the gold was through their, their workers, and now they're in a dilemma. Do we facilitate getting it faster using tools? Are we going to use more biological beings that we were already comfortable with doing? We've been doing it for 3,600 years, and they didn't produce tools then to accelerate it. Why not? Okay, so this whole tool versus meat issue comes up, and I talked about this on a few shows. Which is better under their circumstances to facilitate their mission and meeting their milestones? Well, because they were geneticists, and they realized they didn't have factories to facilitate large machinery. If you look at the kind of machinery that's required to mine gold, it, it, it's massive, okay? So they chose uh, to ponder this issue, and they talked about this in the council meeting, okay? Enlil wanted to slow things down, much to actually his credit, and use tools. Now, how they were going to support that, it wasn't clear. But Andy, being a scientist, probably said, you know, you're asking me to do something with unobtaining them. I can't produce factories and all this in this short period and meet the milestone. But what they knew they could do was genetically jumpstart and create a new creation, a genetic avatar to continue what the, the Gigi were already doing. Okay. So in the account, they chose to do this. Anu gave the blessing. He was there. Uh, Enlo tempered his desire to kill one of them and started placating his father, even put on a fake cry routine. It's really disgusting. <laughs> but, hey, but when Enki said, I could do this, as long as his sister, half-sister, participated with him. Now, now, think about this. He's had his Lord of the Earth title stolen from him by his brother who came 5,000 years later, and he set it all up. And his brother's probably thinking, well, what's he going to do? Run off with my sister in the jungles of Africa and have offspring with him could then be a ruler and then kill me so he takes over? This is probably the kind of back and forth, tit for tat struggles that are going on between these two. So keep that in mind as this is going on. <clears throat> uh, in the Atrahasis account, once they were given the, the okay to go create a primitive worker, Enki and his half-sister Ninma in Africa went to what they called the House of Shimti, which looks like a genetics lab, according to the pictures we've seen, and actually began the experiments genetically to produce a being to replace the Ajiji workers that had been in those mines for 3,600 years. Okay? And it didn't happen overnight. They had several iterations with various approaches that they tried, and some of the abominations and chimeras that they produced probably showed up as some of the animals that you see in the Egyptian and even the Greek depiction of the Minotaur and the half man, half beast. Well, they really did that. They really did that. They were mixing genetics of all kinds to see what could be conscious enough to do our work, but not somebody that wants to be on the council. You see what I'm saying? Like, how far do you go with these replacement workers? And this is, this is a fundamental issue from these overlords of determining what consciousness was going to be given. So think about these beings as the pawns for Enki in a, a evolution of consciousness war. Because if you're going to create a slave worker to do this, how sophisticated do they need to be to understand language or orders or complex building tasks? Maybe they had more than just mining. They were digging out the tigers and the Euphrates and the Atrahasis, uh, building canals, dealing with water issues, all the sustainable things that they needed. What are we doing? So, and again, just tying this back to what you said at the beginning, all this effort is to get the 
So go create the shield exactly. from the door and the sun. Right. And, and you know, uh, as scientists, they were probably not ignoring all the other minerals and heavy metals that they encountered during these mining operations. Right. So, uh, so anytime you saw heavy mining in the ancient past, the Anunnaki were probably, or some other race that was vying for it was involved. Uh, Anki was interested in the Ocho cases. Uh, in that account, after Enki created these beings, okay, he created them ultimately what we can tell genetically from the Neanderthal, the bipedal hominids that were in South Africa where Lewis and Leakey found uh, Australopithecus africanus. In that same area, they discovered many types of pre-historical hominids, okay, and they, they keep coming out all the time. Okay, and which one is man's ancestor, right? And they can't ever take the structural integrity of one and go from there to Homo sapiens sapiens, as Lloyd Pye showed. Uh, the rib structure, everything was different. So clearly there was a there was a chasm between these genetic archetypes. So when uh, Enki decided to, and, and Ninma finally were successful, it appears that Enki used his own genetics, his own seed of sperm, and fertilized the egg of a female Neanderthal being that they found in the steppes of Africa. He told them about it. Okay. So, well, so, so these primitive workers that he created had the part of the genetics of the Anunnaki, but they also had the primitive genetics of these Neanderthal. Now I want you to consider our reptilian, mammalian, and neocortex brain in the three stages in which it evolved. We still have our old system, okay, from the Neanderthal, but we also have this augmented neocortex that came later. Also, so, in this account, these, uh, these beings initially could not procreate. Think about a, a, a mule and a horse that get bred produces a jackass that actually cannot appropriate. It's impotent. Okay? This happens with a tiger and a lion, too, and a lion. It's impotent. Same problem happened with them. Whether he knew about it or it was intentional is not clear. But they were using these uh, Anunnaki females to actually in Greek to fertilize themselves and produce seven beings at a time. They didn't want this to get out of control. Right? So they could control it that way put them to their task, test them, and see how well they do. So, in, uh, before we got to that though, before Enki was allowed to do this, they actually had to have a genetic upgrade to actually meet the labor requirements. So at that point, they had to be comfortable with, could they follow the commands? Could we control them? Are they gonna uprise and overthrow us, just like the Ajiji tried to? So all these things are going through his mind as he's working with his sister to somehow specify the genetic function in this being. And that also includes whether they can speak, how they interpreted commands, all their intellect, right? and now you realize those chimeras are us. Okay. So Enki created the first Adam in their account. They called him the Adamu. And this was approximately 220,000 years ago. We'll get to that. Interestingly enough, he, was, uh, he had attributes of Gandhi and how he taught the people to deal with Incursions from his brother, which I think we can talk about pretty quickly. I think he had a problem uh, that uh, he could not procreate uh, when they and then they had to change the genetic, the 48 uh, right. chromosomes, yeah. the right. 46 chromosomes, right. to equalize it. Right, so we, if you look at human genetics, I have a genetic evidence section we're going to talk about. There's clearly a lot of our DNA that's supposedly junk, which is just a nutty thing to say based on creatures in nature. They don't produce junk in their evolutionary process. Okay? Most animals don't have junk DNA. <laughs> but we have somehow inactivated DNA that we're just now discovering what it is. Okay? Um, uh, here's another picture making you see idea of where he's at. And I want to talk about what happened after 600 years. After 600 years, after getting the genetic upgrade so they could procreate by Enki's son, the geneticist, named Shida, okay, he was the one in the biblical account that upgraded the, or took, supposedly took the genetic material from the Adam off his rib and then created the Eve, right? Well, he's in the account having been the one 
to study what was the problem with the, the DNA that was created from the first chimera, do the upgrade, and at that point, those, these two specimens were taken up to the Garden of Eden, which is in the city of Ridu, right where the tire Schmidt. This was Anki's city up in Mesopotamia. Okay, so the whole story of the Garden of Eden is completely related to what happened in the Atrahasis and this genetic upgrade to replace these workers in the mines in South Africa. Okay. So here's a couple more pictures of Anki. Remember him as uh, Anki in, the, uh, in his fish suit in Sumer. Here's another depiction of him with the water pouring off. He was considered the lord of the waters. So all the oceans were under his dominion, and now you realize why he eventually became called Poseidon. And he was affiliated with the planet Neptune, which we now know to be water and planet. <coughs> Here's another picture of uh, Ahura Mazda in the Zoroastrian religion. Here he is in Greece. And here he is holding his trident. Now, I want you to think about this. This person holding his symbol somehow in our culture became a three-pronged devil with horns. That very symbol. Okay? He was demonized. So the idea of smearing the other one, their symbols and their names, or chipping off their hieroglyphs, they wrote them out of history, they were like that. It happened all through the cultures they were in. They weren't a really peaceful race. Very, uh, very severe, actually. That's more severe than we can even wrap our heads around sometimes. Okay. Oh, uh, no, we already got one. Let's, let's do the half-sister, and then we're going to kind of get into what happened in the occupation. She was at the council meeting. She was uh, the first in vitro fertilized female that produced the Adamu. And they did another one prior to the Adapa that shows up in the Lamentin, or the Adapa tale. So they did a couple of experiments. The one we know is Adam, and he, in the Bible, was her offspring, her first kid. Here on Earth. Also, what's important about her is she turns out she shared the same city as Noah from the Bible. The city of Shurupak was her medical headquarters. Very interesting, you know? And she was a first-hand witness of what happened in Noah's blood. So let's talk about that just real quick while we're here. And I like also to fill you planet Venus and the five-pointed star that the planet Venus traces out over its traversals around, around our, our system. And those, that observatory oh, just right over there was designed to watch. Okay. So, so they go to the Garden of Eden. Anki's there. Enel's there. Now, you have to realize Anki's uh, symbol early in Mesopotamia was the Caduceus because he was the geneticist. So when you see these entwined circuits going around the Caduceus that was stolen by the American Medical Association and the British, for their health system, that was originally his symbol. Okay. Later in the account, we see Ningxia carrying that symbol, who was Thoth. And you see it all through Egypt and everywhere else. Well, there was a, a power handoff, if you will, from father to son with that symbol. So the reason that was uh, important is here in the Atrahasis, Isis, Enki, and a few of the others actually realized that during certain transits of their planet around our planet, there were major disturbances on the surface, whether it was radiation or tilting from the magnetics of their planet, because their planet was much larger than the Earth. And it would actually cause the Earth to wobble a little bit. And because of that, if it did it very quickly, imagine a magnet pulling something over, and then you pull the magnet away, it goes whoop, and it jumps right back. Okay? If it does it very rapidly, what do you think a watery planet would do? All the water that's sitting in the basins is going to be displaced and cover the land. So this urge is flood prone for that very reason. That's why we've had so many flood events in history. According to the Egyptians, there were four major ones that covered the entire earth, and four minor ones that covered various areas that were low lying, like Mesopotamia and so on. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit. They go to the Garden of Eden. Ninma and Enki are the two proud creators of these beings that have been upgraded by uh, Ningxia, who's Enki's son. Okay, and I'll show you on the genealogy table. Actually, does he show up here? No, not yet. 
we'll get to it. At that point, <coughs> Noah, who was the king of Sherupak, was there, and after 600 years, a flood came from the Bible, right? So we know from the Sinatra Hastings account, it exactly the same terms that said after 600 years of this primeval primitive worker experiment, guess what? There were too many primitive workers. They, they were appropriating and proliferating beyond the point that they felt like they could control them. Okay? So at this point, Anvil calls a council meeting in the Sinatra Hastings. It says, guess what? He had brought some up to Mesopotamia around his temple, because uh, that's where his headquarters were as the Lord of Command. In the poor, he was oftentimes around a rook or ur in that area. They're very close to each other. He had enough. These apparently these primitive workers that he had brought up, they were running around like animals, naked. They didn't have the consciousness to be much more than animals, according to him. They were drinking out of the puddles like animals making all kinds of racket. And <clears throat> it was Edel's fault for bringing them up there anyway. He, you know, they were supposed to be down in Africa doing the, the mining. Well, at this point, he said he had enough. And since his father was on the Buru, he called the council meeting and said, the noise has been too great. I, I, they gotta go. He wanted them all gone. All of them, the primitive workers that are our ancestors, he wanted them wiped out. <clears throat> And this is where it kind of gets devastating, and you see the severe nature of animal as the Lord of Command, and what he was willing to do to eliminate these beings. Uh, and I'm not going to get too deep into it, but uh, here Isis, the mother of them, is affiliated with him, her half-brother, and she's watching him as the Lord of Command, having his way with her creation, and Enki too. So, the first incursion, and once the council got together, and whatever the highest ranking on the council said, that's what, that's what they did. They didn't have a choice. So he said, introduce Saruka disease. And you saw all the devastating effects. He introduced a disease into the populace to call them. You think that's not going on now? That wasn't enough. It didn't kill enough. Then he produced a Saku disease that basically made a woman so she couldn't have a baby. Okay. And then that wasn't enough. He's like, okay. Shut up the food, shut up the water supply, and starve them out. That came next. After six years of that, there were very few left. The ones that were left were selling their own offspring into being sold as food to be eaten. And then in the final year, they, were, they, were, they weren't even doing that. They were just eating each other. It turned into absolute cannibalism. Now, what kind of being would allow that under their watch? The same being had an AKA list as Jehovah, Yahweh, and El Shaddai. Very disturbing to me as a Southern Baptist finding this. And his name on a tablet in the Lamentations of War showing he, this is his name in Samaria, and this is his name as the Abrahamic religions came about. It's hard to, it's hard to swallow that. Okay? But it's true. It's what's on the tablets. Okay? Finally, he ordered his brother. Poseidon, Anki, EA, Nudu, all the other names, to bring a flood and wipe out the rest of them. As if what had happened wasn't bad enough already. Just devastating. And so Anki told him no. And at each time that he was ordered, that Enlil brought these incursions against the people, Atrahasis, aka Noah, went to his god and asked for advice how to intervene and stop what was coming. And that turned out to be Enki. Uh, fast forward a little bit. Atrahasis was Enki's son when you look at the genealogy table. That's why he was going to it. And it was very interesting. He didn't say, raise an army, do this. He used uh, methods like what Gandhi would have used, passive resistance and shaming to cause them to stop doing what they're doing. And several times it worked. About three times it worked. Okay. But final act when Enlil asked Enki to bring the flood and wipe him out, he refused. But somehow, they knew a flood was coming anyway. So I want you to ponder this, whether the Anunnaki caused the great flood or they knew their planet was coming in close perihelion with the sun and because of where the earth was going to be relative to their sun, that we were going to have another flood event. And they swore them all to an oath not to tell the people. 
Sound familiar like what might be going on right now? Very similar. Okay, you'll see that's after I do the new order of the update report. Might send a few chills down your spine. Okay, we know the flood came because the whole Noah story that got captured in the Bible describes this event. Okay, and almost everybody was wiped out, including the animals. How do we know this? Later in Tablet 11 of the Atrahasis, they're flying around in their lower orbit vessels surveying the flood damage. And Isis is in the vessel looking at her creation as little sticks in the mud down below, devastated at what had just happened. And she was lambasting Enlil for doing this, for allowing this to happen. Well, about this time, Enlil spots a vessel on top of Mount Ararat in Turkey and said, how could this be? We, the great Anuna, swore an oath that no life would survive. How did this happen? They landed there, found out who it was, and about that time is when Enki disclosed to Enlil in the account, I saved him because the king of Shuruprak, Atrahasis, is my son. And who's going to do the farming and all the work if we're going to stay here and do our mission? Are we going to do it? We need a, we need a populace to do this. Now, in the Bible it talks about it. Noah was pure and his blah, 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 and, he, and that's why he was saved. The reality was he was saved because he was Enki's son. That's the truth. Right. So now you know uh, the truth about that story. And it, but at that point, we realized that was about 12,000 years ago in Turkey. And we have evidence to indicate that the Fertile Crescent is where all the food came from after the flood. All the domesticated cattle came from that area. So to me, to me, uh, it was a very physical, corroborating piece of evidence about what they said in the Ultra Okay, here's a couple of uh, book questions. Here's a couple of uh, pictures of Ninmah. Here's one of her earlier Sumerian depictions. Uh, this one showing her working with Enki in the house of Shindi in the creation of the humans. Here's another one that's even better. You can see their little vessel mixing the clay and the blood as they used as symbols in their document. Here's a picture of their first priest, the Adapa, who was living in the city of Eridu, serving Enki, even in the Adapa tale. Okay? So this was he he got a, he got a good ticket. Since he was the first one, he got trained to be a, basically a priest and taught all the knowledge of the Anunnaki. I bet you didn't know that. But the Adam was brilliant. Uh, let's see. Here's another picture of her in Egypt as Isis. I think I have a couple more. Oh, for some reason, I have a picture of Nishida here, too, with her and the accretion count because of the fact that he was part of the genetic upgrade. And in that account, it's very clear that the Kedusha symbol that represented the geneticist was passed on from Enki to his son, and he carried it ever since that point. Okay. Here's some more pictures of Isis. Notice her affiliated with the Caduceus here, coming out of the egg of creation. Right? So the Caduceus was not just a male symbol. She also showed. Where did you find that picture in the middle? This one? Yeah. I don't remember. Where did you find that picture? Well, it's a good one, huh? It's actually a bronze statue here in the, somewhere in the Middle East. Okay. Coming out. Actually, also look at the. Uh, you think she has any semblance to the, the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, let's think of that. Exactly. That's who it is. Interesting. There's the Ong symbol and the, and the uh, water lily that was affiliated with her as well. Now, now, actually, for some reason, as a scientist, I connected with Enki significantly, but this one just. <laughs> this one, because of his mission really inspired me to write my second book. Yeah. And I'll talk about it. He was mentioned in the Anunnaki village, as I said, uh, affiliated with the planet Mercury, which they called Gaga, and you can see it in the table in the book. Okay, so I gave you the table of the planets and the beings and their names in English, so you could go, okay, the moon was King Gu, Gaga was Mercury, all the way across, okay? As I mentioned, he was responsible for this genetic upgrade, 
Caduceus is very, very important to me, what it symbolizes between energy and matter. And we'll talk about that. <clears throat> He's got a long AKA list, one of the longest ones because of what his mission was, in my opinion. Gazeta, Paul, Hermes, Mercury, Buddha, you were asking about that? Melchizedek, yep. and many, many other names, actually. Both. He's an avatar, you'll find out in the Emerald Tablets, that could take on any body in any form, whatever he wanted to. And pretty much like what they were talking about at the Iglesia Church yesterday at that tour, that being that was surrounded with the light coming out of it. He was, he, actually the Adapa, what we know, was the first primitive worker avatar on this planet. I want to take just a second to talk about that. Enki, in that account, killed one of the Ajiji, sacrificed him, he proposed this to the council in order to create this new being that he and his sister, half-sister, were genetically creating. So the spirit needed to come out of this other one that he infused into his new creation. He does it through a ritual of washing and, and various rites that he spoke to make this happen. It's almost like you'd call that witchcraft today, right? But what you actually witnessed was a being that was so powerful Enki, that he had the ability to take energy and infuse it in matter and create new life. That's hard to fathom for us, as, you know, as far as long as we are genetically and scientifically. We may be able to mix some genetics and do that, but the idea of infusing a spirit into a being, which uh, he called him Yahweh, which was very interesting. The one that was sacrificed, this Ajiji god was called Yahweh, that then became the energy that animated the Adapa. So he created the first avatar. Okay. Well, Nishida talks about avatars significantly later in some of his writings, and we'll get into that. He was the second born son of Enki. Marduk was the first one. So Marduk actually was born of Enki and his half-sister, so Marduk was in line to rule in Babylon. That's why he, he took the ascendancy. And in about 2000 BCE, he actually became the chief deity of Babylon and ranked 50 on the Anunnaki Council. He got rid of them. So the wars that were going on between the kings of the east and the west, especially up uh, uh, north of the city of War, where this launch into the Levantine happened, was, was going on while Marduk was warring for the Bond Heaven Earth facilities to take them away from and himself. So I think Marduk he had a term where he was called the Avenger, and he probably knew about some of the shenanigans that went on between Enki and Enlil in their constant warring as half-brothers. And so he was he felt like he was doing what he was doing on behalf of his father, who he really believed was the Lord of the Earth. So all the other Anunnaki, once those four regions were split, were in their regions. But Mardu stayed up in Babylon, which was Mesopotamia, that belonged to Enlil. So now you know why the kings of Babylon were fighting with the Israelites. Because Enlil was the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he had set up his headquarters after the flood that wiped out the curve further up into Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Okay. <laughs> uh, he was given credit in his Emerald Tablets. He claimed to build the Giza Pyramid and the Sphinx, which had his face on it approximately 16,000 years ago in the uh, zodiacal house of Leo, and I'm going to show that to you in his Emerald Tablet, the state of that. Now, why is Hari, Hari Sawas out of Egypt not recognizing this information? And the halls of Mente that he said were underneath it, all the other stuff that he gave. Okay, so, so this being is very, very important to me because he was given a mission to raise the consciousness of mankind by his father knowing that they've been created to be genetic slaves. So this battle of the evolution of consciousness has been going on since the Garden of Eden, right? So let's, let's go back to that story just for a second, since everybody knows it. So the Adam and the Eve are there, supposedly in the garden without any issues, and they're given an order by somebody not to eat certain things, right? Well, that was Adam. Okay. He, and he was giving them orders not to eat of a, a plant what he was concerned about would change their consciousness so they would know the difference between good and evil. It could have been a mushroom, it could have been whatever, it could have been a hallucinogen. Whatever it was, it had an, an effect on human consciousness that caused 
reflective conscience to be asserted and go, well, you're not a slave, but I'm enslaved. There's an uprising coming, right? And he didn't want that. Okay? Whereas, Enki said no. He was there. The snake, the serpent around the caduceus was his symbol. So he was demonized as the devil, right? Telling him, which he told him the truth. No, if you eat that, it's his medicinal garden already. He's been there for thousands of years. You think he hadn't aggregated plants from all over the world and studied them as a scientist and had them in his garden? Of course he did. He told them the truth. He said, if you eat this, no, you'll have the knowledge of good and evil just like we do. And there you see the very beginnings of the struggle, the battle for the evolution of human consciousness. And he told them the truth, because guess what? When they ate it, did they die, like Edwell said? They woke up to the fact that they were supposedly reflective conscious that, hey, we're naked like the animals. Well, that's an indication of the application of reflective consciousness. That's when Enlil knew he had a problem. Okay. So Enlil lied to them to keep them from attaining a higher level of consciousness than the slave workers he wanted them to be. And he told them the truth, and, and they didn't die. They did get the change he said they would. And at that point, Enlil said, all right, you're out of here. Well, it wasn't his garden in the first place. It was Enki's. So they weren't banished out into some east of Eden and into oblivion. Right after that point, the Adapa that was in the garden, oh, by the way, they were there to see if the genetic upgrade worked. Could they procreate? Could they produce a baby? That's all we wanted to know. So they were lab rats being watched to see if they could procreate. And it worked. Okay, so at that point, they were taken back out of the garden. Oh, looks like we'll be able to make a labor requirement. Let's get them back down to Africa and start producing babies. Okay? But the Adapa did not go. He actually was vectored over to Enki city of Aridu and became the chief priest and was taught everything that he needed to run that city. The rites and the rituals, and you'll see that in the Adapa temple in my third chapter of my book. Very interesting read. <laughs> the Adapa, what his role was. Okay, now, <clears throat> I've got 36,000 years ago here. And I'll explain that to you when we get to the, it's actually about 34,000. You'll see that in the uh, zodiacal table that I'm going to bring up. And what I did is I rerounded backwards from the procession of equinox twice so you could get past the first age of Leo back to the second one and see if it corroborated for what he said. Okay, let's look at some pictures of him. Uh, these are all very much Egyptian looking pictures. Here's Thoth teaching them writing. Here's Thoth holding it long. And the Merkaba, the star tetrahedron of the Merkaba, was very important in his teachings. So imagine a triangle, a two-dimensional triangle going this way, and another one coming down through it. Well, if you did that, you'd end up with the star on the Israeli flag, right? Now put that in three dimensions. Okay, that's what a, a star tetrahedron is. Here's a ball working with a other alchemical uh, symbology as well. So we know from the Emerald Tablets that Thoth was the first alchemist, okay, for those that are familiar with alchemy. This is, I don't know, is that not in focus? No, you guys can use the answer. Okay, Thoth was, Thoth was also credited, or actually, Mikshidu was credited of introducing the calendar in Mesopotamia. His sacred number was 52. That sound familiar? Here he is leading the, the, the king of Ladash in Judea. This is a cylinder seal that was captured where Nikshida here with his twin serpents on his shoulders is leading the king to meet Enki as he's establishing him as the ruler of this city. Very, very interesting. Oh, by the way, the serpent and the dragon in Mesopotamia were symbols of kingship. They weren't some symbol of, you know, some demonic downtrodden. And it really it came from the fact that the entwined double helix of DNA made what looked like a ser two serpents wound around each other to them. And that's why they adopted the symbol. Okay. Here's some more modern uh, pictures <clears throat> as Hermes. 
Here he is as Herbie's uh, with his caduceus. Twin circuits rising up around it. Wings coming out the top, little knob on the top of there. Right? Here he is again. This was on a building in, uh, in the United States where he was shown with his caduceus and his little wings on his helmet. That's Herbie's. And here he is shown as Merlin back in Europe. Okay? He was, the, he was known as a, the magician, right? the wizard, because he could basically, alchemically, take something out of the ether and create it, manifest it as matter. Very interesting capabilities. And actually, that's the fundamental basis of alchemy, when you find out. We'll talk about it. Here's a couple of my other favorite pictures of Nick Shida. <clears throat> this is where it gets interesting in Mexico. We know that as a beginning of the Mayan calendar, that he was responsible for setting up. His symbols and signs are all over it. And the fact that he brought what I believe were Nubian or Ethiopian stone workers from Africa, his dad's domain, where they built those massive complexes on stone, okay, the masons, brought them over to South America, where apparently they had incursions in that area, and they knew they were going to be overrun. He talks about this in the Emerald Tablets that we're going to be dispersed, barbarians are going to take over, there are going to be rise and falls of civilizations. So he actually took this information that he had, his teaching in Egypt, brought it over to South America, and migrated up through Guatemala, up into this very region where he became known as Quetzalcoatl, the winged serpent god. Okay? Now you know where the serpent thing came from. It was from the Caduceus. I thought this was an interesting. This was an archaeology magazine, April 10, 2014 where uh, they were essentially comparing and contrasting some of these uh, pictures where Quetzal Quetzal is shown like this and they compare it with a space suit. Very interesting. So this is uh, kind of telling as well. During the fifth Mayan sun, it's believed that Quetzal Quetzal went underground to get out of his experience. Well, you're going to find out in the Emerald Tablets that he, as an avatar, was immortal, and that he had to go renew his body in the halls of Menti a hundred years out of every a thousand. Okay, so just kind of a heads up. So when he went underground, the fifth sun, probably because there was a procession of the equinox right at that point, right, happening now, we're in the fifth Mayan sun, he was to reemerge and return to the Mayan people at the return of Quetzalcoatl. So it's very important to know. That's how they got fooled by the Spaniards when Cortez showed up here. They thought he was. She did because he was a blonde haired, blue eyed, very tall being, not like the beings that were in Africa or here. Okay. So that's why I put that picture in front of my book. It wasn't to be funny, it's because he was depicted just like Noah was with blonde hair and blue eyes. So, for those that have seen the uh, Lost Book of Enoch, has anybody seen the Lost Book of Enoch? In that account,